Hello, my name is Dr. Natasha Ratnaraja. I am a consultant microbiologist and infectious disease physician in England. This lecture is on the control of multi-drug resistant bacteria in the hospital, although many of the measures will apply to the control of infection of any designation, multi-drug resistant or susceptible bacteria. The learning objectives are to understand the mechanisms of transmission of these bacteria in the hospital environment. This may also have been covered in part in your lecture on outbreak management. You will also understand the measures that can effectively control infections caused by these bacteria. When we talk about infection, it is important to understand the chain of infection, the sequence of events and the important factors that are required for a person to have and to transmit infection. There are six links in this chain of infection. You need a pathogen, a reservoir, a portal of exit, a route of transmission, a portal of entry and a susceptible host. We'll go through these in turn. The first link is the causative infectious agent. This is a microorganism which may be a bacteria, a virus, a fungus or a parasite with the ability to cause disease. The ability to cause infection depends on a number of factors, mainly the number of organisms present and the infective dose, which varies between organisms. Some organisms can be cause infection with just one organism. Others require a large bioburden, a number of organisms to cause infection. The virulence of the organism, the ability of the organism to enter the body and survive in it, and how that organism grows and replicates, and how susceptible the host is to that infection. If we compare smallpox with TB, smallpox is a highly virulent organism and it infects almost every exposed person. And that why, is why it was so important to eradicate it. If we look at TB, it only affects a small number of exposed persons generally in areas of high incidence, such as a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, it can affect a number of, pe of persons, but that's because we increase the number of exposed persons. It is usually seen in those with weakened immune systems who are malnourished or living in crowded conditions. Although we have seen it in patients who have just been heavily exposed to this organism. Our second link is the reservoir. This is where microorganisms can thrive and reproduce. When we talk about reservoirs, we have to think of animate reservoirs, live reservoirs. Obviously in healthcare, the most important is the human being, the human host. But other animate um, reservoirs include animals, insects and birds. Inanimate reservoirs are extremely important in the healthcare environment as well as in the general environment. This can be soil, water, food, feces, in the healthcare environment, intravenous fluids, and equipment, tabletops, and doorknobs, and touch points, areas which we touch a lot in our day. When these have the ability to transmit infection, infectious agents, these are known as fomites, and I will refer to these as fomites where appropriate. Our third link is a portal of exit from the reservoir. So it's how that pathogen exits from that reservoir. In humans, there are numbers of ways that we can have a portal of exit. Blood is common and respiratory secretions are common but also anything ex ex exiting from the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, the urinary tract, or the reproductive tract. So a couple of examples, sneezing or coughing may allow microorganisms to leave the reservoir via the nose or the mouth. Also, microorganisms may leave the reservoir of an infected bowel via the feces. <laughs> 
Our fourth link is the mode of transmission, and this is especially important for multidrug resistant organisms. This is the mode of transfer by which the organism moves or is carried from one place to another or from the reservoirs to susceptible hosts. There are two principal methods, direct transmission, human to human, and generally this involves touching. Sexual intercourse is also another mode of direct transmission, but that will not be discussed in this lecture. Indirect transmission is through non-human materials, for example, insects, utensils and air. When we think about modes of transmission, we think of direct transmission. The infective form of the agent is transferred directly from the reservoir or the host to another person. Now that can be through direct contact, using the hands, direct spread of droplets, or direct exposure to an infectious agent in the, in the environment. For example, laboratory incidents where there are spills or the release of a, an infectious agent, a bite and transplacental perinatal. Modes of indirect transmission where the infective form of the agent is transferred indirectly from the reservoir or the infected host by another person or a vector include biological using a biological vector or an intermediate host, mechanical and mechanical vectors or vehicles, and we'll explain common vehicle transmission in a minute, and airborne transmission. The fifth link is the portal of entry, and that simply is any opening which allows the microorganism to enter the host. The portal of entry is within the same system of portals of exit, for example, the digestive system to the digestive system, the respiratory system to the respiratory system, and the reproductive organs to the reproductive organs. Our sixth link is a susceptible host. The individual has to be unable to resist the microorganism invading the body, multiplying and resulting in infection. Humans are bombarded by organisms constantly throughout the day. We have multiple breaks in our skin, which our body heals, and we have an immune system which will, for the large part, kill microorganisms which are trying to invade our body. But where we have a susceptible host, the host lacks the physical resistance to overcome the invasion by, by the pathogenic microorganism and become susceptible to the disease. It's important to acknowledge that anybody can be susceptible to infection, but especially those with com comprised immune systems or organs, they are at higher risk of certain infections. Often they're not more prone to infections, they're just more prone to actually getting a severe infection as well. And it's important to recognise the differences. So what are the risk factors for acquiring infection? Often we talk about colonization and this is a presence of microorganisms in or on an organ. This merely is the detection of an organism on the human. We see in the laboratory, we see lots of organisms on an agar plate when we culture specimens taken from our patients. But often a lot of these organisms just represent the normal flora of that person from whom the specimen was taken. They are not causing infection. So just merely detecting the presence of an organism does not mean that infection has occurred. For example, if we swab somebody's nose, we know that at least 30% of our population can have colonized with MRSA, Meticillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It lives up their nose, but is not causing any harm. However, if you had a patient from whom you detected MRSA up their nose and they had signs of cellulitis and infection, then they have an infection because that microorganism, the MRSA, is causing signs or symptoms in the host at the site where you have found that microorganism. Usually patients are colonised with a microorganism before they get an infection. That may not always be the case. 
it is unlikely that you can become infected and then become colonized, but it can happen. Infection may result from exogenous, that is external sources, for example, somebody else's hands, or endogenous sources, which is the host's normal flora. Colonization does not mean infection, and we should always remember this. Antimicrobial selection pressure is an important consideration when we think of multi-drug resistant organisms. Antimicrobial resistance is the ability of a microorganism to withstand the effects of an antimicrobial agent. We see this in the, anti in the microbial laboratory when we do antimicrobial susceptibility testing, we know which antimicrobials look resistant to, um, which, which organisms are resistant to antimicrobials within the laboratory. We see growth of that microorganism up to the discs or um, looking at breakpoints within the laboratory. Antimicrobial resistance may occur naturally via evolution of the microorganism and mutations, natural selection. Often this is chromosomal, so it is part of the organism's DNA. We see it um, with certain vancomycin resistant enterococci, not all vancomycin resistant enterococci are transmitted. We see it with other organisms like lactobacilli. Um, and we don't necessarily need to do infection control measures for those organisms. However, where you have environmental pressure, for example, giving an antimicrobial agent, you can get subsequent mutations, which allow the microorganisms to survive and reproduce. These mutated microorganisms carry the antimicrobial resistant genes within plasmids, which can be transferred to their offspring, which allows the microorganism to replicate and continue having antimicrobial resistance um, offspring. Antimicrobial selection pressure is more common when we use broad spectrum antimicrobials, for example, meropenem or piprocillin tazobactam. When we use narrow spectrum antimicrobials such as amoxicillin, that selection pressure is far less. And this is why we have such a, a increased importance of antimicrobial stewardship. We should always use narrow spectrum antimicrobials wherever we can. Sometimes we don't know what the organism is and we may need to do broad spectrum antimicrobials microbial therapy because the patient is very unwell but once we have the antimicrobial susceptibility profile we should reduce our spectrum down to what we can safely use for that patient. Multidrug resistant organisms are predominantly bacteria. Definitions vary but they can be resistant to one or more classes of antimicrobial agents. Some literature describes uh, multidrug resistance as having resistance to at least one antimicrobial agent in three or more classes of antimicrobial agents. However, when we look at the examples, metacillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus might just be resistant to oxacillins. Vancomycin resistance might be just due to resistance to vancomycin and nothing else. Then you look at multidrug resistant TB, which by definition has to have rifampicin resistance and also isoniazid resistance. Um, and you can see that it can be difficult to decide on what is a multidrug resistant organism. But in the definition by multidrug, you would expect at least one or more drug resistance. Clostridioides difficile is classed as a multidrug resistant organism because this is an organism which can reside in your bowel. And when we give antibiotics, it basically wipes out a lot of good bacteria and all the bacteria that's susceptible to that antimicrobial. So that allows a Clostridioides difficile to overgrow and to predominate in the gut, causing Clostridioides difficile infection. <laughs> 
The modes of transmission of multidrug resistant organisms are similar to the modes of transmission of any microorganism. And the principles of infection prevention and control are similar regardless of the degree of resistance. We should always do our basic precautions. However, sometimes we require enhanced precautions depending on the pathogenicity of the organism, whether or not they're multidrug resistant. And we'll go through this now. So transmission of infection within the hospital environment generally occurs through four means. There can be contact transmission, respiratory droplets, airborne spread, and common vehicle transmission. We'll go through these in turn. Contact transmission is by far the most frequent and the most important mode of transmission within the healthcare setting. It involves the transfer of organisms via direct contact between an infected or colonized person and another person, often a healthcare worker or another person like a visitor, touching the hand or an infected body surface or a colonized body surface of an infected or colonized patient. This might cause infection in the person touching the infected or colonized person. However, more commonly, indirect transmission occurs by the transfer of organisms from the intact skin of the healthcare worker who's picked it up from the infected or colonized person to another susceptible patient via direct contact. So our hands are very, very important. It can be transient on our hands. So if we then swapped the hands of that person who we suspect had transferred the organism, we might not find the organism because it's transient and the organism has actually gone onto the other patient and the healthcare worker may have washed their hands. There can also be indirect transmission. The infected or colonized person could touch a fomite and then the healthcare worker could touch that fomite and then touch another susceptible person. You can see it here. There's direct transmission from the infected patient who touches the healthcare worker and then the healthcare worker can touch another susceptible patient. Or there can be indirect transmission where the infected or colonized patient has touched the fomite, the healthcare worker touches that fomite, picks up the organism on their hands and then transfers it to another susceptible patient. The organisms that are commonly spread via contact transmission tend to be those that commonly reside on the skin and or which can cause skin infections, for example, impetigo, abscesses or scabies. So Staphylococcus aureus is probably the most common organism that's spread via contact transmission. Group A strep, Streptococcus pyogenes and scabies, but also antimicrobial resistant organisms like MRSA and VRE. These are skin residing organisms, but also any multidrug resistant organism. If the person is colonized with these organisms and it is disseminated across their body, then you might pick that up through contact. It's important not to forget about infective diarrhea. Although that is the fecal wall route and fecal to fecal transmission, because the organisms are there in infected bedding on surfaces, they can also um, result in contact transmission, such as norovirus, salmonella, which has a very, very low infective dose, shigella, and Clostridioides difficile. Droplet transmission. Respiratory droplets, which contain microorganisms, can be transmitted through breathing, talking, coughing, or sneezing. Generally, droplet particles are greater than five to 10 micrometers in diameter. They can only travel a short distance before they fall and settle on a surface less than one meter. So you have to have very close contact within one meter for transmission to occur directly from the infected person to the contact. During close contact, these droplets can be deposited directly onto a susceptible person's mucosal surface, eyes, mouth, or indirect transmission can also occur by a person touching an infected surface fomite. If you can imagine people are coughing and it's dropping onto their sheets, um, onto utensils. And then if you touch those, you, are, you could auto inoculate your own muc mucosal surface. 
Organisms which can be spread via droplet transmission include Neisseria meningitidis, SARS-CoV-2, Streptococcus, Streptococcus pyogenes when you've got pharyngitis or a chest infection, influenza, RSV and measles. Airborne transmission. This is where we have droplet particles which are smaller than five micrometers in diameter and they're known as droplet nuclei. These droplet nuclei contain microorganisms and can remain suspended in the air for prolonged periods of time. And they can travel vast dis distances over one meter. Generally, it tends to be the viruses that can be transmitted um, airborne. And that tends to be things like measles, which can stay in the air for up to two hours after an infected person has left the room hantavirus, varicella, and the variola virus. But we also have to consider aerosol generating procedures which might spread infection. There is no universal definition for what aerosol generating procedures are, although there are some commonalities. This has been especially important over the last two years with the pandemic, where countries and departments have struggled to define what an aerosol generating procedure is, a SARS-CoV-2 has really turned it on its head a little bit. If we look at the WHO definitions, they define aerosol generating procedures as intubation, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, tracheotomy, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, bronchoscopy, and sputum induction. It could be argued, and it has been argued in several of the literature, that sputum induction, if you have a heavy cough, um, then that might cause some aerosol generation. Other possible aerosol generating procedures considered by WHO are high flow oxygen and nebulization, although nebulization tends to spread just the drug rather than the organism. There are cases where it, it is considered that SARS-CoV-2 has been spread via nebulizers. Organisms that are transmitted by the droplet route then can also be transmitted by the airborne route, such as SARS-CoV-2 and measles. Common vehicle transmission. This is an uncommon mode of transmission for multidrug resistant organisms, but it is important to exclude, especially when you have more than one person affected. In common vehicle transmission, microorganisms are transmitted via contaminated items such as food, water, solutions like saline or NG feed, medications, medical devices and equipment. And we have seen that in England with contaminated um, food with salmonellosis, um, and with medical devices and equipment. This tends to be just for bacterial and mycobacterial replication for common vehicle transmission. Viruses need cells and they, viral replication cannot occur in a common vehicle. But common vehicle transmission, as I've said, can result in multiple people becoming infected and unwell. And then you have outbreaks. And the examples are here. For multidrug resistant organisms, there have been examples of intravenous fluids that have been contaminated with gram negative organisms, contaminated multi dose medication vials, and contaminated bronchoscopes, which haven't been decontaminated appropriately. In the UK, we currently are seeing a number of patients who are suffering adverse effects of getting Mycobacterium chimera infection following cardiac surgery due to infected heater cooler units being used during that procedure. So you can see that it's important to break the chain of infection so there isn't ongoing transmission. So how do we do this? It's always important that infection control needs to be part of your routine practice and standard precautions must always apply. However, transmission precautions are also important, especially with uh, multidrug resistant organisms. So this is a, a Damani's five pillars of infection control. 
and they're fairly straightforward, but people do forget about them. So you have isolation and barrier precautions, decontamination of equipment, prudent use of antibiotics and hand washing and decontamination of the environment. Your standard precautions are basic infection prevention practices that should be used as a bare minimum when caring for patients. Everybody that comes into your hospital or into your department should be risk assessed for infection and the possibility of infection, especially communicable infection. Hand hygiene should be as natural to healthcare workers as breathing, as should respiratory and cough hygiene. Personal protective equipment and safe management of, management of equipment, environment, blood and body fluids and linen are important and should form part of your hospital's infection prevention and control policies. I won't cover blood, blood and body fluids or linen um, in this lecture because it doesn't really pertain hugely to multi-drug resistant organisms apart from the safe disposal of linen and blood and body fluids, but they may be covered elsewhere. Personal protective equipment has obviously been at the forefront in the last two years with the pandemic. What we use depends on the mode of transmission and the pathogenicity or transmissibility of organisms. For direct contract transmission, we like aprons and realistically they should be plastic because the plastic apron attracts the organism it's sticky surface so the organisms can stick on them it means we have to be very careful when we remove our aprons otherwise we could then recontaminate our hands gloves are important but can provide a false sense of security we often see patient uh, staff walk through wards with their gloves on and they've touched multiple surfaces if they have touched a surface that is infected or colonized with an infection with a, an organism and they go and touch another surface or patient, then they are transferring microorganisms from one area to a person. So generally, we should only use gloves if we're undertaking an aseptic procedure or dealing with body fluids, open wounds or a visibly contaminated area. <clears throat> For airborne or droplet transmission, the same applies apron and gloves plus a mask. The mask will vary according to what you have available and what the risk is. There has been a lot of use of fluid resistant surgical masks in the pandemic, but there is a shift towards using FFP3 masks for aerosol generating procedures or high risk organisms, really pathogenic, your category four organisms. Your FFP3 masks protect you as well as your um, immediate environment. And fit testing is essential. You need a very tight seal across your, your face so that no organism can get in. And that's why if you have a beard or um, your the face shape is, is slightly different, you, you, it's essential for fit testing to occur. Respirator hoods are used for highly infectious pathogens, especially respiratory pathogens, but also when um, a person is not able to wear an FFP3 mask. You can see through our talk that the transmission through hands through contact has been very, very important, even with airborne and droplet, because you can touch a fomite. Hand hygiene, as I said, when it's correctly done is the most important element of infection prevention and control. It's cheap, it's simple to implement, and it reduces the prevalence of cross transmission of infection and antimicrobial resistance. And it's important in preventing contact transmission as well as indirect contact transmission. If we look at the WHO five moments of hand hygiene, this is when you should really be concentrating on your hand hygiene so before patient con before patient contact touching a patient before you undertake a clean or aseptic procedure after blood or body fluid exposure after you've touched a patient and after you've touched the patient's surroundings because of the risk of picking up 
um, organisms from fomites. The use of alcohol hand based hand gel has actually revolutionized hand hygiene. If your hands are not visibly dirty, then you can use alcohol based hand gel for decontamination of your hands. It means in places where you might not have access to a sink very readily or when you're on a ward round, you have your alcohol hand gel near you. So you can use that with, with minimal disruption to your day. However, if your hands are visibly dirty or contaminated proteinaceous material, blood or other body fluids, you must wash your hands with soap and water. This reduces the soil, the debris and your bio burden of organisms. It is important to use soap and water if you have direct contact with a patient who has known or suspected spore forming organisms, specifically Bacillus cereus or Clostridioides difficile. And this is because spores are very, very hardy and they're resistant to alcohol, chlorhexidine, iodophores and other aseptic agents and can live in the environment quite freely in a, a non-vegetative state for a long time and then germinate when the time is right. So we talk about breaking the chain, well, let's come to another pillar, one of the two pillars, isolation and barrier precautions. Two real main sources of forms of isolation, source isolation, where we can find the patient harboring the infectious agent in a single room, usually with an ensuite. It prevents spread of infection from one patient to another and was previously known as barrier nursing. Sometimes we talk about barrier nursing patients on the ward, and that is using your PPE and, and making sure that you are not spreading infection from that patient on, in a bed to another patient. And that is usually when we don't have enough side rooms to isolate the patient. Protective isolation is here to protect an immunocompromised patient who is at high risk of acquiring microorganisms from either the environment or the patients or the staff or the visitors and was previously known as reverse barrier isolation. Historically, source isolation we achieved by placing the infected or colonised patients in negative pressure isolation rooms and protective isolation patients were placed in positive pressure isolation. So negative pressure, the air goes into the room from the outside, from the corridor, and is extracted out, usually through a HEPA filter in the ceiling. With positive pressure rooms, the air comes from the patient and is pushed out into the corridor from the room, and that protects the patient because the patient's flora goes into the room, whereas with negative pressure, the patient's flora is being sucked out through the HEPA filters. In the United Kingdom, we have health technical memorandum for isolation rooms, and there has been a slight change to what rooms are recommended, although with the pandemic, this changed again because we didn't have enough of these rooms. And these were neutral pressure rooms where the, the room where the patient is, is neutral pressure with 10 air changes per hour of mechanical air change rate. So the air is constantly being changed. The anteroom or lobby, which is the room where the sink is before you go into the patient room, is positive pressure. So it pushes organisms out into the into the corridor. The anteroom of the lobby has to have a positive pressure of eight to twelve pascals with respect to the corridor. And that's just what it looks like the the document that we follow. It is important to isolate patients as soon as they are admitted or found to have a multi-drug resistant organism, diarrhea and or vomiting, undiagnosed rashes or fevers, group A strep, um, for example, necrotizing fasciitis or even pharyngitis because that can spread infection. And patients who are admitted from another hospital who may be infected or colonized with resistant microorganisms. In the UK, anybody who has come from abroad who has had hospital treatment abroad has to be isolated in case they are harboring a carbapenem producing enterobacteriales. Bacterial meningitis, patients who are suspected of having bacterial meningitis have to be isolated because of the risk of spreading 
um, Neisseria meningitidis. The isolation policy will depend on your local policy and the availability of side rooms, but most multi-drug resistant organisms will require isolation of the source patient. We also have to think of equipment and environment because as we have discussed, fomites in the environment are also effective vehicles for transmission of infection. Decontamination is a series of processes that effectively remove or destroy infectious agents or other contaminants such as organic matter in order to prevent the spread of infection. There are three main processes, cleaning, enhanced cleaning and disinfection. Cleaning is the physical removal of dirt, dust and soil from surfaces and usually involves water, detergent, cloths and mops. In most hospitals in the UK, we tend to use as a detergent, we tend to use a lot of chlorine based um, detergents because this kills spores. Cleaning can be manual or automated and the success of cleaning is really in um, in the effectiveness of the cleaning process of reducing the microbial contamination and the amount of bio burden or soil present. It's suitable for, clean, for items that are not in direct contact with the patient and medical equipment that are in contact with the patient's skin, such as your stethoscope. It removes orga organic matter on which infectious agents thrive, but cannot completely eliminate microorganisms from the environmental surfaces. And then we have enhanced cleaning, which is used in addition to the standard cleaning. It's usually carried out in response to a specific infection prevention and control requirement, such as if you had a person with a multi-drug resistant organism, and or if you had something that was particularly infectious and could spread, such as in outbreaks. So if you have, for example, an outbreak of norovirus on your ward, you would want to clean more frequently because the environment is continually being contaminated. And you wouldn't just clean more frequently, you would use a chlorine based um, cleaning product and you would look at touch points because people forget about those. So your computers, your phones, your, um, your drugs trolley, they get touched quite frequently and so they can be contaminated quite frequently and need additional cleaning. When a patient who is known to be infected with a pathogenic microorganism, multidrug resistant or not, is discharged or transferred, their bed space usually has an enhanced clean. And the curtains need to be considered to be changed as well. Some places still use cloth curtains. These need to be cleaned, especially other places may have the resources to have um, disposable curtains and these need to be changed. When you've got manual cleaning, which can reduce the number of viable infectious agents in the healthcare environment, but is unable on its own to inactivate certain microbes such as viruses and spores, we think of disinfection. And that's when we use a hypochlorite solution for blood and bloody fluids. And as I said, some places in the UK, most places in the UK now use hypochlorite routinely because sometimes you're not always sure what is in the environment. Automatic technologies do exist and these are very useful as manual disinfection is only ever partially effective. 50% of ward surfaces in hospitals are adequately decontaminated with the use of chemical disinfection, even with um, chlorine based solutions. And especially where we have spores or very multi-drug resistant organisms, we may do a manual clean, then an enhanced clean, and then we may use an automated disinfection. Most commonly, this is hydrogen peroxide vapour. But in other instances, especially when you need a faster turnaround time, we will use ultraviolet sea light, UVC light. That has the benefit of having a first faster turnaround time, as I've said, compared to hydrogen peroxide vapour, where you need to allow for the, the vapour to um, be cleared through the air changes within the room. Obviously, this is for side rooms. You wouldn't, unless you were able to empty the whole ward following an outbreak, and that may be covered in your outbreak lecture. <laughs>
Another important tool in breaking the chain of infection is the prudent use of antimicrobials. Antimicrobial resistance is increasing with more than 50,000 deaths per annum attributed to antimicrobial resistance infections across Europe and the US. And this was in a 2014 report and you can imagine that it is probably much higher now. We saw with the pandemic that antimicrobials were used fairly indiscriminately and we saw a number of multidrug resistant organisms across England and we, you may have seen it in your own hospitals. In Europe in 2008, more than 4 million people acquired a healthcare associated infection and about 37,000 people died as a direct result of this acquisition. Apologies. There is global variation in resistance patterns. In Europe, in 15 countries in 2013, more than 10% of Staphylococcus aureus bacteremias were due to MRSA and up to 50% in some countries. Whereas in lower income countries, um, drug resistant TB was more of a problem. And there were estimated 480,000 new cases in 2013, most of which were untreated. Antimicrobial consumption for human use increased dramatically between 2000 and 2010, almost a 40% increase. And this is in part due to a greater awareness of sepsis, but it is also due to demand and the fact that patients are living longer as we're able to do more due to advances in healthcare, which is a good thing. However, even though people are living longer, and doing better, we need to reduce our antimicrobial consumption and make it more uh, sensible. Variation in usage is, is common globally. Some countries are decreasing usage, but an ESPOR um, data from 2014, which is a European data, showed that usage in hospitals increased by 12%. This is um, the O'Neill report from 2014, and it estimates that by 2050, ant antimicrobial resistance will be responsible for 10 million deaths worldwide. Also estimated that this would be the picture of antimicrobial resistance globally. And you can see here that Africa is going to be one of the hotspots for antimicrobial resistance but none of the countries or continents get away with um, a, a lack of deaths from antimicrobial resistance. And it's important that we deal with this because often it's not just because of the organism, which might not be particularly pathogenic, it's because we do not have the antimicrobial um, agents available to, to treat these resistant organisms. The cost is huge. This is prior to the pandemic, that it was estimated by 2050 it would cost over $100 trillion American dollars. But more importantly for me is the risk of death. It is much higher in patients infected with multidrug resistant strains. So we really need to get on top of this. In England, we have a Start Smart Than Focus toolkit. Now, this can be applicable to any country. Obviously, do not start antimicrobials in the absence of clinical event, uh, evidence of bacterial infection. So you're starting smart. But if you have to start a, an antimicrobial, which may be due to the sepsis program or because you've got a very, very unwell patient, you must review that decision with the patient at 48 to 72 hours. By this time, if something was going to grow in the lab, we would have that antimicrobial uh, susceptibility pattern for that organism and we can decide do we stop the antimicrobials because there's no evidence of infection has the patient got better on the antimicrobials can we switch them from intravenous medication to oral antibiotics do we need to change the antibiotics we've got the antibiotic um, susceptibility profile can we narrow the spectrum of antibiotic do we need to continue can the patient go home and have some antimicrobial therapy in the community. Whatever we do, we have to document our decision, provide reasons for our decision, and give a review or stop date for all antibiotic prescriptions. <laughs>
So we'd start smart and then focus and wherever possible de-escalate antimicrobial therapy, whether that be from a broad spectrum to a narrow spectrum or changing from an intravenous to an oral option. We must review our antimicrobials with microbiology results and assure adequate dosing, underdosing of antimicrobials can also lead to antimicrobial resistance and appropriate duration of antimicrobials. The majority of infections we encounter can be treated with five days of antimicrobial therapy. If you have a deep seated infection, it might require longer, but this is when they, you need to be speaking to your infection specialist, your microbiologist or your infectious diseases physician to have a, a multidisciplinary discussion of the treatment options. Good antimicrobial stewardship is an essential component of reducing the incidence of multidrug resistant organisms. There are other measures to control multidrug resistant organisms. Surveillance, which may have been discussed in your outbreak um, lecture. We have electronic surveillance systems. We have to, in the, in the UK, we have to um, notify our, the UK health um, HSA for any organisms that we, I, we identify within our hospital system. And by recording those, we can identify periods of increased incidence. This is where you have two patients with the similar organism and a similar antibiotic phenotypic profile who have got the organism and linked by time and place. So, for example, they were both in the same ward at the same time and they have both acquired this organism within the, a 28 day period. When we identify that, we send those samples off for typing. And if the, the typing comes back that these two patients have a related strain of, of an organism, then it's defined as an outbreak. And then we have to have multidisciplinary meetings to investigate this, how this occurred. Root cause analysis, what were the, the opportunities to prevent ongoing transmission? And what can we learn from those? Because that is very important in medicine. We have to learn constantly. And that's where education, training and teaching, we have to train our staff on infection prevention and control. We have to educate them and it is an ongoing process. And every day is a teaching opportunity. Infection control policies are paramount in any hospital system or healthcare environment. And infection prevention and control teams are essential for any healthcare environment. As our antimicrobial guides, we can then, through our antimicrobial policies, we can say, if you have this infection, this is the antimicrobial you should be giving first line, because these are the common organisms that we pick up in our microbiology laboratory. And this is our resistance pattern. For example, if you had um, a 40% resistance to coamoxiclav in your urinary specimens, you would not advocate using coamoxiclav first line for a urinary tract infection because 40% of patients are not going to respond to that and they may go on and develop a deeper or systemic infection. There has to be what we would call a board to ward approach. Your hospital, your trust, your board, your upper management must be invested in infection prevention and control programmes. Otherwise, there will be spread of multidrug resistant organisms. Because infection prevention and control is everybody's responsibility. Right from the moment that patient sets foot through your doors of your hospital, Everybody that sees them, from the hospital porters to the domestic staff to the caterers, we have to put measures in place so that that patient doesn't acquire an infection. And especially they don't acquire a multidrug resistant infection. So in summary, good hand hygiene is key. If you do nothing else, you must do good hand hygiene and good antimicrobial stewardship. If possible, and you have the resources, and many um, places don't, we don't have it in England routinely, you should be looking at antimicrobial ward rounds daily if possible, so that you can keep an eye on who is prescribing well and who is who needs a little bit more education.
vary precautions and isolation whenever you suspect or determine that a patient has a multidrug resistant organism or highly pathogenic organism. Decontamination of equipment environment should be done on a daily basis with enhanced cleaning and decontamination whenever you have a multidrug resistant organism. We're all only human and when we are tired and everybody is really tired after the pandemic, little slips can have huge consequences and for us as well as our patients because we feel demoralised if we have given unknowingly a, a, a transmitted an infection to another person. And that's why education and training is essential and learning is vital. We should share our practices, not just the not so good, but also the good practices, share with uh, colleagues across our healthcare economy and across different um, diff healthcare economies, because we all have the patient at mind. Thank you.